My name is Patrick Maha. I'd like to uh, thank everyone for showing up today for uh, episode six of season three of the Young Researchers Forum on Detonation. Um, today, it's my pleasure to introduce to everyone uh, Dr. Yoram Kozak. Kozak, uh, he got his uh, master's and PhD from the Mechanical Engineering Department at Ben Gurion University. Uh, he went, then went ahead and was a postdoc with uh, Dr. Alexei Polymenko at Texas A&M University. And now he's a uh, senior lecturer at Tel Aviv University since uh, 2020. And today he's going to be giving a talk uh, titled Numerical Gas-Based Cellular Detonations versus Reality, uh, What's Still Missing? Uh, so I look forward to hearing his talk and like to uh, welcome him to take the floor. Thank you very much, Patrick. Just to share my screen. A second. So you see my screen? Yep, everything looks good. Okay, great. So uh, I'm very glad to be here at the Young Researchers Forum on Detonation from Fundamental to Applications, and I would like to thank the organizer for letting me give this talk. So I'm going to talk about numerical gas phase cellular detonations versus reality. What is still missing? So this talk is meant for the basically for everyone. So I'm going to give uh, basically introduction to the field of gas phase cellular detonations, and, but I'm going to highlight the important things in order to convey the points that are important for my talk. Um, so I hope it will be interesting for everyone. So a short introduction about detonations. So detonations are supersonic combustion waves. They move at a velocity very high than the speed of sound. And they are very different from subsonic combustion waves from deflagrations or as we call them, flames. And this talk is going to be focused on pre-mixed gas phase detonations, which means that the detonation is propagating through a gaseous mixture of pre-mixed fuel and oxidizer. And the detonation velocity is a very important property of a detonation. And more than a century ago, people developed the Chapman and Jugay CJ theory, which was developed by Chapman and Jugay, of course. And in this theory, the reaction products reach Mach 1. And basically, we can find the detonation velocity for a self propagating detonation using thermodynamics. So we know the initial state of the detonation, the final state, which is called CJ state, and we can find the detonation velocity. And in general, I would say that this CJ theory agrees well with experiments. Of course, it depends on the channel width and so forth, but in general, it works quite nicely. And, but CJ theory doesn't say anything about the structure of a detonation wave. So about 70 years ago, Zeldovich, von Neumann, and Dürer developed the ZND solution independently, which is basically a one-dimensional steady-state solution, which uh, is based on a very simple notion. So we can see the shock at the, everything is at the shock frame of reference. So we have a mixture. Uh, which is being compressed by a shock, and the mixture basically heats up and compresses, so we get high temperature and density and pressure, and this is the von Neumann state. We have the induction zone where reactions don't start, then reactions start, temperature go, go up, and because of expansion, pressure and density go down, and we get to the CJ state. So now we have a structure here, it's not only initial state and final state, the CJ state, we have some kind of a structure. And of course, that uh, Z and D solution is associated with different lamp scales. For example, this induction zone is a characteristic lamp scale of the Z and D solution, and the reaction zone is another characteristic lamp scale. So this is important for the, for the rest of the talk. But reality is more complex. So the donations are much more complex than this, and gas phase detonations simply are unstable. So they are not one-dimensional, they are highly transient. And in multi-dimensions, what happens is that we have these basically transverse waves that start to interact with the leading shock. So if you zoom in at the front, you can see here these triple shock configurations. So we have the incident shock, the transverse wave, and the max time. And they are all coinciding at this triple point. And well, this triple point trajectory basically creates a cellular structure, all these fish scales that you see here, because pressure is very high at the triple point. And this is the cellular structure, essentially. And 
This can be measured experimentally via soot foil. So we can take a carbon uh, carbon soot foil, put it on the channel or tube, and get the cells. So you can see the cells, and the, these trajectories are basically a record of the maximum pressure trail, which is the triple point trajectory. And the differential cell width is this size here. Um, and this is the length of the detonation width of the detonation cell. And this is an, uh, the width is an important engineering quantity. Why it's important? Because it gives us the detonation propagation criteria. So if the cell size is, uh, if the channel width is smaller than the cell size, it means that the detonation uh, cannot propagate through it. The initiate direct initi energy required for initiation of a detonation is proportional to the cell size cube. So it means that if it's small, then it's easier to initiate a detonation. And the critical diameter is also proportional to the cell size. So if we have a tube and the detonation is propagating through a tube, the criteria for it to continue to propagate outside the tube is also determined by the cell size. So it's basically a fingerprint of the mixture. And Accordingly, uh, it's important for different applications. For example, if you want to understand industrial explosions in fuel storage facilities, and we want to improve their safety, we need to understand how detonations behave. And I give you an example, the Bunsby incident that occurred in the UK uh, 20 years ago. And this is what remained of the oil storage facility where because of the leakage, uh, the fuel evaporated and detonated, causing huge destruction. So in order to prevent that, we need to understand better detonations. And another emerging application is propulsion and energy conversion system. So conventional engines are based on deflagrations, but today people are trying to develop advanced detonation engines. And you can see here an example. So this is a rotating detonation engine that the Japanese uh, launched into space last July, and it was operated for six seconds. So these engines have potentially can be with higher efficiency and more compact than traditional rocket or jet engines. So again, in order to make these engines a reality, we need to further understand the dynamics of detonations. So what do we know currently about gas, cellular gas phase detonation? So I'll give a very brief um, review on the literature. I cannot mention all the <laughs> important uh, of course, papers, but I'll try to give a brief review. So in general, experimentalists measure the detonation cell, cell width for, diff, for different mixtures. So, and there are many people that done that. I mentioned a few, but today, basically, we know the detonation cell width for a lot, a lot, a lot of mixtures. And based on this data, people develop simple correlations that can predict the cell width according to different uh, weights. And the easiest way is according to the ZND solution. So you can take the ZND solution with multi-step chemistry, and you get all these length scales from the solution. You can get the induction length, the F-reaction zone, you can get the heat release length, and all of these are linearly proportional to the cell width. That's what experiments have shown. For example, you can take an example. Of, so uh, Westbrook and, or and Ortai found that uh, for certain mixtures, the, this ratio of the cell width to induction length is about 30. And today we know that for different mixtures, we get different constants and so forth. And then people develop more elaborate semi-empirical correlations that depend on the additional dimensions too. So now this ratio is not constant. For example, Gavrikov suggested that it's a, a function of the effective activation energy of the mixture and the normalized initial temperature. And uh, this is normalized by the heat release length. And NGSR used this uh, dimensional stability criterion, which is another dimensional group that uh, depends on other dimensions. And these correlations work usually quite nice. And also, people develop all kinds of simple models that uh, provide fundamental insights and even could predict the experimental uh, detonation cell size. And I give a few examples. Some of these are based on acoustic wave theory. Most of them are based on blast wave theory. And I'm going to elaborate on that further in my talk afterwards. And also people have done stability asymptotic analysis and got all kinds of insights on the complex dynamics of cellular structure. 
And again, these are only a few examples, but there are many papers on this topic. And finally, there are numerical simulations. So people have done all these numerical simulations with multidimensional, solving the multidimensional compressible reactive Euler or Matthias Tox equations in 2D, in 3D, using single step chemistry, using multi step chemistry. And these are very computationally demanding simulations. And people started doing that about 30 years ago. Uh, and this is just a short list of papers, but there are tons of papers that people have done this simulation. However, high fidelity simulation still cannot replicate for first principles to experimentally measure the potential cell size. So, so far, numerical simulations cannot replicate all the, the data that experimentalists found on the cell size. It does, doesn't work. And I'll, I'll give you an example from our simulation. So this is the Godspace dodecane air numerical simulation. So we are solving the 2D compressible reactive Navier Stokes equations. So these are pressure contours. Uh, everything is at uh, the shock frame of reference. We got a mixture of dodecane air. It starts to detonate. And you can see here the very high pressure at the triple points. Of course, this detonation web is unstable. So the conditions here are stoichiometric dodecane air mixture. We're using 24 species reduced and dodecane air mechanism. So we cannot solve for hundreds of species, but we can solve for uh, 24 and, and not, uh, which is not that, let's say, few reactions. And initial mixture conditions are one atmosphere, initial temperature of 420. So this is enough to make sure the everything is consistent and the dodecane is at gas phase. So everything is pre-mixed and in gas phase. We are using Athena RFX, which is uh, within our solver. It is massively parallel. It's based on a high order Godonov method, so it means that it's uh, suitable for high speed compressible flows. A bit of computational details. So, this is with a grid of 4,000 by 2,000, domain of 16 by 8 centimeters. So, it's about 16 million cells. Uh, taking into account that we are solving in 24 species equations and uh, also multi step reactions, this is a quite uh, Computationally demanding simulation. Resolution here is uh, about 20, 43 cells for induction lamp, so it should be sufficient. And this was done in collaboration with Dr. Sais and Lib Damati and Professor Alexei Polotnenko from the uh, University of Connecticut. So I'm going to show you the simulation just for you to understand how this numerical detonation look like. So we destabilize the, the wave, and you can see that it starts to propagate. So again, it's from the shock frame of reference. So we have here the dodecane air coming from the left. And you can see how they detonate and burn. And you can see the pressure is very high. The detonation wave is, of course, not one dimensional. It is highly transient. And in fact, for this, uh, for this mixture, it's highly unstable. We get all these structures, transverse detonations, and so forth. Um, but that is what we get, right? We are solving the equations. We are using all these physical models, and we get results, right? We get suit for it, basically. That's what I want to show the cells. So let's look at the suit foil. So this is the suit foil for this case. It propagated for about two meters, and eventually it reached some kind of a fully developed cellular structure. So let's zoom in into this and see what we get. So before we start to analyze what we got, let's see what the literature says about what is the cell size that is supposed to be. And again, I remind you, this is eight centimeters. So there is no actual experimental data about dodecane air, but all the all the experimental results of heavy hydrocarbons are pretty much the same. So if we look at octane or decane for uh, stoichiometric air mixtures. The cell size is about 4.2 centimeters, according to experiments. If we look at JP10, according to Austin and Sheffer, it should be about 6.6 .6 centimeters. So it should vary between 4 to 6 centimeters. Let's see what ZND theory says to us. So we can run ZND solution with multi step chemistry, and we get the induction length, which is about 0 0.168 centimeters. So according to a correlation from the literature, the ratio between cell size and induction length should be roughly 30. 
and we get about five centimeters, which is a reasonable estimation. Now let's look at the numerical simulation. So first thing, it's not that easy to decide what is the cell size here because it's quite irregular. If we can do some averaging and estimation, we can say roughly it's say two centimeters, but it's definitely, it's hard to say that it's five or four or six. So what we get here is the usual picture. Cell size from numerical simulation is smaller than the experimental size. So numerical simulation basically do not agree with reality. And the question that everyone is asking is why? So I'm going to outline two possible reasons for this discrepancy. And I'll show you how we try to further understand how to mitigate this problem. So the first uh, possible reason for discrepancy between numerical simulations and reality is that, in my view, that there is no standard method for measuring the donation cell dimensions. And this is true for both experimental and numerical supports. So when people are measuring the cells, basically it is known that sub subjective measurement errors can be as high as 50%. So if you are measuring experimentally with an error of 50% and numerically, with an hour 50% of 50 to compare these two results, we will get very high errors. Now, I'm not saying this is the only source of error, but this is this could be part of the of part of the story. And the question is, can we develop a standard method that can basically objectively or as much objectively as possible can measure the cell size for both experimental and numerical supports? And we are currently working in this uh, direction. So the idea is to take a suit foil, which is an image, either numerical or experimental, and basically use a computer software to detect the cells and get basically the cell number or distribution uh, objectively. But this is not the this is not the topic of the talk. And although this reason is important, I will focus on the second possible reason. And um, this is an ongoing topic that will be maybe addressed in a different way. So we are not going to address this discrepancy in this talk. I'm going to focus on the second reason. And the second reason is that, in my view, that various physical effects might not be taken into account on numerical simulation. And again, this is not my idea. Many people suggested that, and it's probably correct. Um, so people suggested that vibrational equilibrium effects can be the reason for this discrepancy. Momentum and heat losses from the walls under certain situation might be substantial. The Friedrich confinement shape. So apparently, if you get a rectangular channel or a tube, you get a different cell size. Inappropriate equation of state. So we are assuming usually ideal gas equation of state or pressures are very high. Maybe it's not appropriate. Turbulence under, under certain conditions might affect the cell structure. And one can think of many other effects. So in theory, it's possible to take into account all these effects and well, do the simulation and see whether it fits reality. But this is a very difficult exercise to perform. And the reason is that these simulations will be very computationally expensive. If we're talking about turbulence, for example, doing a DNS of detonations would be impossible. Maybe we can do LES that people have done that and take into account all these effects. However, there are many parameters that we can investigate here, right? I mean, there are tons of models. It's not clear in which conditions, which model will affect the, the results. And again, each simulation is very computationally expensive. So the conclusion from this, in my view, is that the key to resolve this issue is to fundamentally understand how numerical detonations are affected by different physical models. So basically, we need to understand from fundamental point of view, how this beast of numerical detonation behaves, how different physical models change the cell size. And once we understand that, we will be able to get the right experimentally derived cell size. So easier said than done. And clearly this problem is very challenging. So I'm going to invoke a quote by George Foley, who said that if you can't solve a problem, then there is an easier problem that you can solve find it. So solving this problem currently, in my view, is very difficult. So let's try an easier problem that no one knows the answer for and solve it. 
So let's take the simplest case possible. Let's assume that we are solving now detonations in using the two decompressible reactive Euler equations. We are using adiabatic slip walls. We are using calorically perfect gas equation of state. Single step first order Arrhenius kinetics. So everything is very simple. We got reactants turning into products with a single step reaction and regular cell structure. So seemingly, this is a very simple configuration. But if you think about it, it's still governed by many parameters. So the cell side depends on the activation energy, on the exponential factor, on the heat release, on the specific heat capacity, on the specific gas constant, and the initial temperature and pressure of the mixture. And each one of these affects the cell structure in different ways. And I need to do simulations in order to find them. So even this fun, very fundamental case, we can ask questions um, that no one knows the answer for. So the first question is, what are the dimensionless groups that govern the cell size? So even for this simple case, it's not clear what dimensionless groups govern the cell size. I mean, there are correlations that suggest all kinds of groups, but can you prove what dimensionless groups govern the cell size? Second question, how changes it? Changes in each dimensional groups affect the cellular structure. So if you change the parameters of these dimensional groups, what will happen to the cell size? Yeah, people have studied what it happens, maybe for some groups qualitatively. Can we do it? Can we know all the changes and make it quantitatively? And finally, can we develop a simple model that can predict the dimensional cell size obtained by numerical simulation? So instead of running all these expensive simulations, can we just create a simple model that will predict what the numerical simulation will give us? So let's start with the first question. So what are the dimensional groups that govern the cell size? And I'm going to invoke here a quote by Dr. Sus, who said that sometimes the questions are complicated and the answers are simple. So in this case, the answer is, relatively simple. Uh, for the other question, it's, it's much more complicated. But we need to do several assumptions in order to, to show this. So first of all, we need to assume that the channel is sufficiently wide, so walls do not affect the cell structure. And second, we need to assume that the detonation wave is fully developed, so the channel length or the main length does not affect the cellular structure. Once we do that, the cell size is governed by the following physical parameters, again, for this simple case of two-dimensional, regular, single-step reaction, and so forth that I mentioned earlier, these seven parameters. So we have the activation energy, specific heat capacity, gas specific, specific gas constant, initial temperature and pressure of the mixture, heat release, and pre-exponential factor. Now, for convenience, we can replace the pre-exponential factor with the Z and D solution half reaction length. Uh, and we can do that because basically all these parameters are independent of A. And for each value of A, we can find some F reaction length that is corresponding to it. And this choice is arbitrary. I could choose any length scale of the Z and D solution. And this is uh, just for convenience. So I can write that lambda is a function of these seven parameters where I replace A with XD. So let's see what we got here. So lambda is governed by seven dimensional parameters with four types of units. If you're using SI units and assuming that everything is uh, per mass. So it's kilogram, meter, second, and Kelvin. So we can invoke here the Buckingham Pi theorem. So we have seven dimensional parameters, four types of units, which means that we got three dimensional scores. And this one, this XD is the only length scale. So we normalize the cell width with XD. And we see that there are three dimensional groups, and the choice of these are, is arbitrary as long as we take into account all these parameters. So we choose typical groups from the literature, effective activation energy, which is a function of the von Neumann temperature, which is a function of five of these parameters, the heat capacity ratio, and the normalized heat release. So basically, the answer is quite simple. For this simple case, the, cell, the normalized cell size is governed by three dimensional groups. And this actually proves the linear dependence of the cell size on the Z and D characteristic length scales. So lambda is linearly proportional to XD, where G is a function that depends on the mixture characteristics, thermodynamic and chemical reaction. And this constant will be different for different mixtures. 
And this is actually correct for any typical length scale of the detonation structure. So the detonation cell length will be a different function of the same dimensional groups. Now, this is the most fundamental case. For realistic detonations, additional groups maybe should be considered, I don't know, Reynolds, Brantel, all kinds of groups. But in all groups, in all cases, this is the fundamental groups that govern the detonation cell size. This is the most basic ones. So we cannot still answer how all these physical effects affect field detonations, but we got something to start with at least here. Um, so let's go to the second question. So how changes in each dimensional groups affect the cellular structure? So we now know the three dimensional groups and we can ask the question, well, if I change them, how this will change? Now, in principle, we can map G, right? I mean, we can run numerical simulation with these three parameters and find this value. But again, this approach is not very ideal. So we need to explore 3D parametric space here with three dimensional groups. And for finding each point in this parametric space, we need to use a computation expensive simulation. Also, these parameters are continuous and we can only find discrete values. So we need to do many, many simulations in order to map the function G, even for this relatively simple case. So the answer to question two is actually coupled to the answer to question three. So if we can develop a simple model that can predict the, the potential cell size numerical simulation, we can map G. And that's what we did. So we developed a simple physical model that can be calibrated to a discrete set of numerical simulation results in order to continuously capture this function G. And now we go to the blast wave model, uh, which I mentioned earlier. So the concept of simplified blast wave model is well established and people have done, created these models since 40 years ago, and they can repl replicate experimental results. They can get fundamental insights about the cellular structure, but no one has tried to replicate numerical simulations. So I'll just explain to you how it works in general. So we have, uh, you can see the cells here. So we have uh, the cell cycle that starts with the blast kernel, and then it expands and it drives a strong shock. So initially the strong is shock, so the temperature and pressure fronts are coupled. Reactions are basically instantaneous. And then it starts to expand and if the shock weakens and we have the coupling. So we have a pressure front, induction, zone and temperature and it's continued to propagate and then it starts to interact with neighboring cells so we have these blast kernels here that interact with it and it continues to propagate and it's further weakens and at some point we got this gas pocket and the neighboring cell the transverse wave basically collide and ignite a new kernel that starts the cycle all over again and then it continues to propagate so this is the basic uh, mechanism, at least for uh, regular cellular structure, which is captured by the blast wave model. So basically we can model the cellular structure via blast waves. That, that's the idea. And this is not new in any sense. So the blast wave model we developed is based on observed dynamics, of course. And the physical models that we use are identical to numerical simulations. So we are using a 2D planar geometry, so it's cylindrical blast waves, remix mixture, no heat or momentum losses, single step to solder arrhenius kinetics, calorically perfect gas equation of state, and regular cell pattern. The detonation wave is propagated in the CJ, uh, the CJ uh, velocity. So all these assumptions are the same as our numerical model. And as a result, this, simp this simplified model is governed by exactly the same dimensional groups. So that's the idea here. So I'm not going to get all into all the equations. I've explained to you in general how it works. So we have the seven input parameters, and then we guess. So this is a completely analytical model, but it requires iteration. So we guess some initial blast wave kernel size. Then we need to guess the point star, which is the point where the fronts are decoupling. And then we check whether the pressure front average velocity is equal to the DCJ velocity. If no, we, guess, we do another guess. If yes, we continue. Then we check whether the resulting gas pocket at the end of the cell is equal to the initial blast kernel, because again, this should be exactly the same because everything is regular. 
If no, we get another. If yes, well, basically the length that the pressure front propagated is the cell length. Then we guess this approximate angle between the cell width and the cell length. And we calculate according to multiple compressions, which take into account the basically the leading shock and the reflection of the transverse wave, the pressure at the blast kernel. If these pressures are equal, we found the cell length and the cell width. If no, we do another case. So basically, with this model, we can find the length and width of the cell. So the blast wave velocity in our model is governed by analytical model by Vasiliev and Nikolaev. And this is a very simple model, analytic, completely analytical. And we are using uh, the overdrive factor, which is basically a free parameter uh, as suggested by Crane et al. So this model does not capture the donation uh, cell structure from this principle. It is just a calibration tool, which is physically based. That's the idea here. So I can show you the, uh, this analytical model by Nikolaev and uh, Vasiliev. So this is the pressure front velocity normalized by the CJ velocity. So this is CJ velocity. And the model is based on, and this is time normalized by the time for point star. And the model is based on the notion that initially the wave is overdriven. And then at some point, the fronts decouple and it becomes underdriven. So of course, this does not capture the real dynamics of the donation because this point should not be the, the derivative here should be continuous and in this model it's not but this is a simple calibration tool that captures qualitatively the transition from uh, overdriven to underdriven conditions so you can see results so this is the normalized position as a function of normalized time you can see the pressure front position you can see here at black in black the temperature front and you can see the dcj velocity and what you can see here is that when the solution is converged, first of all, the pressure front is moving at the average this, the DCJ velocity, and the initial blast kernel radius and final blast kernel radius are equal. And in this case, the length that the pressure front propagated is the cell length. So how we calibrate this model? So we conducted 19 simulations Again, with the simple conditions that I described, with different values of the three-dimensional scopes. And we did it for a range of certain parameters, of course. And we only choose cases where we get regular structure. So this is only for regular structure detonation theorem. And the numerical setup was carefully chosen. So you can see it here. So basically, we are using a moving frame of reference. And we are using slip adiabatic walls. The everything, all the channel width and channel width, channel length were chosen to be sufficiently long that all the walls effects will not influence the solution. The resolution, we used five cells for the heat release, uh, for the heat release zone, um, 20 for the F reaction zone, which led to something like 25 million cells for simulation. And we use initial random perturbation to initiate the detonation. So the cell size is completely independent of the initial perturbation because it's random. So basically, what we did, we ran the simulation and we found this optimal overdrive factor. So again, this is a this is a calibration exercise. So we found this relation, and it turns out that this optimal overdrive factor depends on the three-dimensional groups. And once we use, once we plug this relation into our model, there is a relative error of less than 20% between the numerical simulations in our model for both cell width and cell length, and for all the 19 examined cases. So we were able to calibrate the blast wave model to fit numerical simulations. And you can see the results here. So our model predictions are uh, denoted uh, at, in X's and the numerical simulation results are in O. You can see the normalized cell uh, width as a function of the effective activation energy. 
and we got different cases for different values of gamma and normalized heat release. So in total, we have 19 simulations and the error bars show a relative error of 20%. So you can see that the model is able to quantitatively and qualitatively capture the numerical simulation results for all the cases with a relative error of 20%. And we've done this exercise also for the cell length, normalized cell length. So the model was cal is calibrated and it can capture the dynamics correctly. We also compared the blaster model against results from the literature. So we compared the blaster model predictions against numerical simulation of flu et al, that also use single step and uh, calorically perfect gas equation of state. So you can see here the normalized cell size, the function of uh, the effective activation energy. These are the dots of the simulations of flu et al, and this is our model. And the gray area here shows where we get irregular patterns. Of, this, of the cellular structure. So if the cellular structure is regular, you can see this point, the agreement is excellent. And, and we also be able to capture the, the known trend that for regular detonations, basically as we increase epsilon, the cell size increases. We saw that in numerical simulations, people have shown that also 20 years ago, and this model captures the trend very nicely. Uh, for Mildly irregular cellular patterns, you can see when but the pattern becomes a bit irregular, we get a rough estimation. Once we get to the irregular regime, you can see that our model cannot predict the results, which is not surprising because it is meant for regular detonation. So our model predicts that the, the cell size should go up. In reality, it goes down, it saturates, and it goes further down. And of course, we have a lim these limitations. So we can only predict things in this white area. So let's see some results. I'm going to show you that uh, this normalized cell size dependence on different dimensional groups is quite complex. So this is normalized cell size uh, in, as a function of epsilon for different values of gamma. And this is normalized cell size as a function of epsilon, effective activation energy as a function of the normalized heat release. And what we see here is that, well, when epsilon increases, cell size increases, which is consistent. But what's interesting here is that if you look at the normalized cell size for a certain value of epsilon, both for the normalized hitteris and uh, gamma, trends are non-monotonic. So if you look at low heat release, cell size is low, you increase the heat release, it goes up. And when you increase it, it goes down again. So these trends are are, again, are dependent on the dimensional groups. Uh, and we can see that even these very simple cases are not that trivial. trivial. Uh, we also investigated the influence of the initial uh, mixture temperature according to our model. And we were, I'm going to show that basically the model naturally captures all kinds of trends qualitatively that were observed by experiments. So we can see here uh, the cell length width and blast kernel as a function of the initial uh, mixture temperature and this is dimensional and you can see that it increases as the mixture temperature increases the initial mixture temperature increases which was observed by experimentalists however once we once we normalize this you can see that uh, the normalized results are completely independent of the mixture initial temperature which was also observed by experiments this qualitatively and we also investigate what happens when we change the initial mixture pressure and again you can see that the model naturally captures the trend that when you increase pressure cell size go down but the model predicts also that when we normalize things there is no dependence on the initial pressure so what we can do with this model? So we saw that uh, fine, give us fundamental understanding of numerical detonations, but this is actually can be a practical tool. So recently, Lou et al. demonstrated that it's possible to calibrate gas scale detonation simulations with single step chemistry and calorically perfect equation gas of state in order to capture all the important detonation properties. So they show that it's possible to capture the CJ velocity, the von Neumann and uh, chapman Juguet temperatures, and most importantly, the cell size. So basically, they show that we can take this 
simple single step simulation and if we calibrate the flow and reaction parameters correctly we can basically replicate realistic mixtures or detonations in realistic mixtures so I'm going to show you that this raster model, if we couple it with an optimization procedure, it provides a new method to quickly calibrate the flow and reaction parameters to capture all of these detonation properties. And we only need two inputs. We only need to know the mixture initial conditions and composition and experimentally measure detonation cell size. That's it. And this is the procedure that we use for optimization. So basically we solve the ZND profile with a detailed chemistry mechanism. We obtain the DCJ velocity, the von Neumann temperature, TCJ, and we can calculate the effective activation energy of the mixture. Each of these are basically given by an algebraic nonlinear equation, and we can solve these equations together and basically get values for gamma, the molecular weight, heat release, and the and activation energy. Once we do that, we can constrain the cell size by choosing different values, basically guessing different values of the prep exponential factor, use the blood curve model to see what cell size we get until we get the right cell size according to experiment. And once we finish that, we have all the flow and reaction parameters that replicate realistic detonations in realistic mixtures. So I'll show you the results. So we replicate uh, experimental results by Austin, and these are solar detonations in hydrogen, oxygen, argon mixtures. So all the model parameters for the numerical simulations are derived via the new optimization procedure. So we are running again single step, Arrhenius kinetic simulations, 2D, and uh, with calorically perfect gas equation of state. So this is our, these are our results. So we can see a mixture of hydrogen, oxygen, and argon. At low pressure, and this this is the experiment. This is our simulation. You can see the scale. So the experimentally derived cell size is uh, about half centimeters, and you can see that we can capture the cell size quite nicely with our simulations. When we are further dilute, diluting the mixture, cell size go, goes up, and we are still able to again tune the mechanism to capture it. And even when we're further diluting it, we get a cell size of 1.1, and we're further diluting it, and we can capture it. And we also capture, of course, the CJ velocity and the von Neumann and uh, Chapman Judea temperatures with this model. So let's look uh, exactly quantitatively what are the differences. So you can see if you compare our simulation cell size against the experimental results, we get maximum relative error of below 15% for all the cases. So basically what I'm showing you is that this blasting model is not only for fundamental understanding, it is a practical tool for basically replicating detonations in realistic mixtures. So to conclude, so we saw that gas free numerical simulations cannot predict from first principles the experimentally obtained cellular structure. I outlined two possible reasons. The first one is lack of a standard method for measuring detonation cell size. The second one is that the influence of different physical models on numerical detonation is unknown. Uh, and we concluded that the, there is a need for fundamental understanding of numerical gas phase detonations. So we show that even for a very simple case of 2D regular patterns, numerical detonations with single step kinetics and calorically perfect gas equation of state, things are not fully understood. Uh, we revealed the dimensions books that govern the detonation cell size for this simple case. We saw the influence of each dimensions, dimensions group on the cellular structure. We developed a simple blast wave model that can quickly predict the numerical simulation results. And we demonstrated that it's possible to use the blast wave uh, with a new optimization procedure that can replicate realistic cellular detonations in arbitrary mixes, mixtures. I would like to thank uh, the students and projects that contributed to this work, Nao Tzadok, uh, which finishes the MSc uh, degree recently, and two of my postdoctoral fellows, Surya Uruganti and Marcel Alves. Thank you very much for listening.
Thank you, Yoram. I appreciate that. It was uh, very interesting to see. Um, so for everyone here, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, either raise your hand and mute yourself and ask the question, or you can type them into the chat if you'd rather, and we can read them to uh, for the speaker. So I don't see any questions yet. I had one uh, real quick. I saw you, it was 19 different cases of gamma and activation energy and heat release. Did you only run a, a single simulation for each case, or were there multiple simulations for each case? Um, what do you mean multiple? Uh, so for each set of conditions for a specific activation energy gamma heat release, did you run a single simulation? So yeah, um, it's a single simulation. Um, I mean, the domain was always quite mm -hmm. big to get the same cell cycle, quite long to get the cell set cycle. I mean, we played with the the width and so that it's independent. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a single simulation, yeah. And again, the, the initial perturbation is random, so it's completely independent of the initial perturbation. So you get a single, uh, for this three dimensional group, you get a single cell size, normalized cell size. That's the, the idea. Mm -hmm. Is there some, uh, is there some concern about overfitting then uh, when you go to the, the fit for the parameters? Uh, if you only have a kind of a single data point uh, or a single cell size measurement for all those points, you don't have a distribution. Um, what do you mean distribution? Um, it, even though it was a long simulation, you still uh, only have a kind of a single measurement of cell size from a simulation for each set of the three parameters. Are you concerned that like you talked about this non-monotonic trend, is it possible that's just a result of, of overfitting to the limited data set? Uh, no, we actually see that in, in the numerical simulation, even in discrete values, we see all these trends. I mean, the model is able to capture qualitatively all the, all the correct trends. There is some discrepancy between you know, the exact value, but the trends, these are the same trends. We see the same trends in the simulations. Thank you. Uh, so there's a question in the chat. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. In the simulation, the detonation cell size may depend on the distance between the two adiabatic walls. What is the minimum distance do you suggest to diminish the true, compu the true computational domain size effect on the detonation cell size? And distance between two adiabatic. What is the minimum distance you suggest to the main effect? So we we use a criteria from the literature which we did it at least for 180 half release this uh, half half release distances. Uh, that was the criteria. We tried to do a wider channel, and we saw that we get the same. The same result. Um, so that's about the criteria that we found that is working and it should propagate more than a thousand uh, half reaction uh, lengths also in order to get to some uh, developed state. And this is also agreed with the literature. So that's what we found in uh, when we studied all the effects of the different uh, domain sizes and, and length of the channel. Hi, Patrick, I've got a question. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the non-monotonic relationship between the activation energy and gamma uh, that you found. Uh, so active, effective activation, so, okay. Um, so what we found is that when you normalize the cell size, you get, uh, you get this non-monotonic behavior when you normalize it. Um, that's what we found. Uh, I don't know how to explain it physically, but when you normalize it, that's what you get. Yeah. If you normalize it by XD. If you okay. don't normalize that was in it, your... you don't get it. But, <laughs> but uh, if, if you normalize it by XD, it's not monotonic. Yeah, changes in gamma and if they normalize it release are non monotonic with effective activation energy, it always goes up, goes up. Yeah. That's what okay, we found. Okay, this was with your blast model and not the simulations, right? It's also in the simulations. Oh, okay. 
these trends are refounded in both cases. But the blood wave models give you the continuous curve. I mean, you cannot find the continuous curve with the simulation. But these are the trends that we found. Uh, not sure how to explain them physically, to be honest. Uh, but again, this is for normalized. So normalized and non normalized of this. I see. It's a bit tricky. All right, thanks about that. And uh, just a bit touching on the point about uh, measuring cell size that you know you didn't talk about in your uh, in your presentation. Um, I know there's been a few attempts to to kind of do it, um, and I think one that's worked pretty successfully is the autocorrelation. So you take your your soot foil and shift it along, uh, just in case there's anyone out there who's who's curious about that. And I don't know yeah, if what you've used to. The problem is that people are not using them, right? I mean, usually people just measure right. by hand. That's the problem. It's part of the problem, in my view. I mean, there is no standard way to do it, and this induces errors, which we're not sure what they are. But yeah, okay. are thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there any other questions from any of the participants or anything? Uh, yes, may I ask Coach? Yep, go ahead. Okay, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I have another question. Actually, in detonation, uh, usually there are two lens scales. One is the induction lens, and the, the other one is the lens for the heat release, which is much smaller than the induction lens. If you consider two lens scales, I mean, I, I mean that the non dimensional analysis, analysis may be different. Uh, can you comment, comment on that? So first of all, uh, take into account that this, what we're studying here is numerical detonations. So in numerical detonations, they're not always, what I showed you here does not have to be related to actual mixture. So in some of these cases, actually the reaction length is bigger or comparable to the induction length. Um, can you, is this answering your question or maybe Maybe I missed one of the things that you asked. Yeah, I, I mean that there is a lens for the heat release, which is much smaller than the induction lens. Mm -hmm. Because the induction lens is the distance between the heat, peak heat release and the shock wave. But the, 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 the lens for the heat release, I mean the half, half maximum for the heat release, there, there's some kind, something called the excitation time excitation time is released to the heat release and the, the ignition delay time is released to the induction lens. Basically, there are two, two different different lens scales. Yeah, the, I mean, there are different lens scales. We analyze things according to the half reaction uh, length. Uh, okay. In principle, you can do the same exercise for any length scale that you want and derive uh, different correlation. Uh, Okay, but uh, I don't know. According to the literature, you you can do it. There are correlations for different length scales, and they all work the same. I mean, but the proportionality constant will be different. Okay, okay, thank you. All right. Uh, if there's no other questions right now, I'd like to thank our speaker again. So thank you very much, uh, Yom, for, you. for doing this. I appreciate it. Uh, and with that, we'll conclude uh, episode six of the uh, Young Researchers Forum on Detonations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.